morning, Canvas. Will you stand with us as we begin this morning in worship? not met before, uh, it's because you've come to Canvas for the first time in the last two weeks, and I was not here. Two weeks ago, uh, I was up in Lake Tahoe doing a wedding for our own beloved Emily uh, and Jake Glennon, and promptly tested positive for COVID the minute I got home. Uh, thankfully, thank you, Beckett. Um, <laughs> thankfully, the only person I believe I have infected is my lovely wife, so uh, she's doing fine, but uh, prayers for her. Thank you to everybody uh, to, who kind of helped make things happen in my absence. Uh, last week was the first week I got to participate in worship via live stream. Uh, first time I ever got to do that, which was actually wonderful. And so I wanted to take just a quick moment to thank our, our tech team uh, for all their hard work. It was wonderful. I, I felt like I got to be here and yet was safely at home, and it was just technically perfect. So thank you for your hard work. If you are joining us via live stream, thank you for doing that. We are glad to have you here. Uh, reminder that it is a communion Sunday. Those of you who are seated here can see the communion table over there. Um, and you're thinking, that doesn't look right. Uh, isn't our communion table a giant behemoth of a table? that we inherited from another congregation that was looking to get rid of it years ago because it was gigantic and built for a room four times this size? Yes. Um, and so it has departed briefly because it is being, all the wood is being re-engineered into a new table that will be used here that is more in keeping with our scale and let us move things around a little. And I have, you've not seen it, I have seen it. It is beautiful and is going to blow your mind. So it is in the final phases of being 
uh, finished, but it is gorgeous and much to look forward to there. As we come to worship, as you well know, it is the uh, celebration of American independence this weekend, uh, a moment in history that feels particularly difficult to, to wrap our minds around. It feels particularly fraught at this moment. On the one hand, the ancient historian in me is deeply aware of the gift of self-government and what an extraordinary rarity that is in human history. And then it, I think it is entirely in keeping with God's intent for humanity that we govern ourselves and not be subjects of tyranny. So we have been incredibly blessed in, in the, the human um, condition, in human history, human society, to have this incredible opportunity to govern ourselves. And that is an incredible blessing that we have received. And yet at the same time, part of the human, the tragedy of the human condition is that sometimes when we are the recipients of incredible blessing, we begin to think that we're blessed because, frankly, we're kind of extra awesome. And that therefore, actually nothing we do can really be all that wrong because look at how blessed we are. In fact, anything that we do with this blessing we've been given is probably divinely ordained. And we know from all of American history that we've never lived up fully to the ideals we ourselves claim and which we believe rightly embody some of God's vision for human justice, compassion, for everyone to be able to live out their unique identity and to give their unique gifts to the world. So this morning I, I hunted for a prayer from church history that would capture all of that and I couldn't find one. So this is my contribution to the liturgy for years to come. O Lord, our heavenly sovereign, you have formed your church from the peoples of every nation under the sun. And to you we pledge our ultimate loyalty. We thank you for the gift of these United States and the vision of freedom, equity, and justice upon which they were founded. And we confess that we have yet to live up to our aspirations or for your intent for civil society. In these fractious times, we ask your aid that you might grant us the wisdom to govern ourselves with humility, to regard our neighbors as friends, to seek unity and understanding for the sake of the common peace, to value truth, and to surrender our every claim for retribution. Soften our hearts to one another so that we might preserve the fragile treasure that is the gift of self-government. This we ask your people who gather in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand as we sing together.
difficult dimensions of the life of faith is believing that the promises of old are actually being fulfilled. Right? All of us would look back to the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with David, the law of Moses, and acknowledge that certainly these are the, the reliable promises of the Lord, and hold them as utter convictions that the day will come when God will make good on all of those pledges for our redemption, deliverance, and salvation. And then we fall into the pattern of believing that indeed that day will come. It's not today and it's not tomorrow and it's not next Thursday, but the day will come some many centuries from now. As we get to the, the sermon, we'll talk more about it, but one of the great struggles for the people of faith from the very beginning has been to believe that the day of God's fulfillment of those promises is now. That the, the promise of God's deliverance is being worked out in our midst. The kingdom has not come in its fullness, but it has definitely come. And the work of the Spirit is carrying the redemption of creation out in our midst. And in no place is that meant to be more true than at this table. That when we gather here, we are truly stepping into God's future. We stand at the banquet table of the king. Though we do so in a small room in Irvine uh, with some faces we recognize, it doesn't feel particularly timeless or um, omnipresent, eternal. And yet to gather at this table is to gather with the whole communion of God in his presence. And so with that notion in mind, you know, let us come before the Lord in prayer. Holy God, creator of heaven and earth, with joy we praise you and give thanks to your name. For you commanded the light to shine out of darkness, divided the sea and the dry land, created the universe and called all of it good. You then created us in your image to live with one another in love. You gave us the breath of life and the freedom to choose your way. You promised yourself in covenant to Abraham and Sarah, told us of your purpose and the commandments through Moses, called for justice and the cry of the prophets. Through long generations, you have been faithful and kind to your children. So we acknowledge the great and wonderful are your works, Lord God Almighty. Your ways are just and true. And therefore, we lift our hearts in joyful praise, joining our voices with the choirs of the angels, with all the faithful of every time and place, to declare before your throne, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We praise you, God, for sending your only Son to live among us, to share our joy and sorrow. He told your story, healed the sick, was a friend of sinners, and obeying you, he took up the cross and died that we might live. We praise you that he overcame death and is risen to rule the world. He is still the friend of sinners. We trust him to overcome every power that could hurt or divide us and believe that when he comes in fullness and glory, 
we will celebrate victory with him evermore. Remembering your mighty and merciful acts, we break bread now and share one cup, giving thanks for your saving love in Jesus Christ. As you raise our Lord from death and call us with him from death to life, we give ourselves to you to live for him in joy and grateful praise. We ask now that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon these your gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Jesus, redeemed by his blood. Send us in the power of that Spirit to live for others as Christ lived for us, announcing his death for the sins of the world and telling of his resurrection to every tribe, tongue, and nation. Draw us together into your presence, for it is in Jesus' name we gather, and with him we pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread he gave thanks, and before his disciples, he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Eat of it, all of you, always, in remembrance of me. That very same way, after supper, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, always, in remembrance of me. For as often as the church shall gather to eat from this bread and to drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. Those who are serving, please come forward. Everyone who confesses Jesus Christ as Lord and who trusts in his resurrection for their restoration is, of course, welcome at this table. Parents, if you've got little kids with you and you think they're ready to receive the elements, they're certainly welcome to do so. They're a little too young to grasp what's happening. Bring them forward anyway to experience the family coming to the table together. If you need gluten-free elements, Debbie and I will have them at the center aisle. Otherwise, as you're ready, I invite you to come forward and receive the gift of God's food for your soul. Who's strange? 
Come sit at the table Come taste the grace And there's rest for the weary A rest that endures Earth has no sorrow That heaven can cure Once again, for an opportunity to come before you and worship through song and sacrament, we don't take it lightly that we have this place that we can gather together in reflection of your love and the truth of who you are and the life-changing aspects of learning about that. We pray that you continue to open our eyes and our hearts to those truths this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Haley. Uh, kids, you want to head off to Sunday school are welcome to do so. Parents are always invited to go with your kids if you would like. I mean, the original plan a million years ago was that part of what we would do in Sunday school is help teach parents how to disciple their children the rest of the week. So we were often in the like, hey, parents, you're welcome to go to Sunday school with your kids. And the general response was, that's okay. Um, understandable, but you're always welcome to do that. Uh, before I officially begin, I just want to thank Ian, uh, who's hopefully watching us from home, uh, for filling in for me two weeks in a row. One of them he was planning on, one of them he was not. Um, I'm not always the best at asking for help, and so it's nice to have friends who um, sometimes have your back before you know your back needs getting. Uh, it also occurred to me He's the only friend I have who in 22 minutes can both accurately quote Thucydides and reignite the great American oatmeal cookie controversy uh, in one sermon. And then it occurred to me, he's actually not the only friend I have who could do that. I have a variety of friends who can quote Thucydides. Uh, I actually have a really good friend who named his pet iguana Thucydides in college, which is beginning to make me think I need to take a long look in the mirror about what that says about me. Um, but I'm grateful for Ian and to have those people in my life. And the reason I keep mentioning Thucydides is in part because, uh, those of you you don't know who that is, um, a Greek historian lived about a generation before Plato. So early 5th century BC, wrote a very famous history of the Peloponnesian Wars. And, in Thucydides, there are a great many speeches that are given, and as Ian mentioned a couple weeks ago, 
Thucydides even explains a bit why uh, speeches are used in the recording of history. Uh, 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 speeches being a literary device common in the ancient world that was meant to do more than simply document what words were spoken. It was never meant to be a newspaper account of word for word exactly what happened, but it was a literary device to help uh, express the, the, the broader meaning of an event. And as you may know, and we'll soon find out if you don't, in the book of Acts, Luke includes many speeches. Sometimes speeches that feel, frankly, quite repetitive. It feel like, didn't we just hear somebody give roughly the same speech like a page ago? Today, we actually have the second speech of Peter, uh, second speech ever of Peter recorded in Acts. It's also the second speech in about, well, it's the second speech in two chapters. And it's a speech that's going to sound not too unlike the one he just gave on the gathering of Pentecost. And because we know them to be speeches to be important literary devices, it's tempting for us at first blush to just read through them and think, I actually kind of know all this content. Skip on. What happens next? But we would be wise if, if Luke is going to go to such regular efforts to recount speeches of important people, to really ponder why he is choosing that literary device. And there are many ways he could communicate the same content. And surely there was a speech that was given. But whatever Peter spoke uh, in Solomon's portico that day is certainly longer than the 18 English sentences we have here. Clearly a literary device. We would be wise to think very, very carefully about who is speaking when they're speaking, where they're speaking, and to whom they are speaking. As you will soon see, uh, for today, the who is the apostle Peter. The where is in the courts of the temple in Jerusalem, and the when is the after the standard afternoon service of prayer and worship that took place in the temple. And the to whom is the crowd that has just beheld a lame man whom they've all known. Uh, they've beheld him healed, indeed participating now in worship on his feet, walking, indeed jumping, and praising God. A healing which they all recognized was accomplished at the hand, or really at the word, of Peter. Now, my lovely wife tells me that I need more graphics, so I searched the source of all truth, the internet, uh, and I found this uh, artist recreation of the first century temple. This is Herod's temple in Jerusalem. I realize the, uh, the, the words are a little tough. So uh, in the very back, that, that series of columns, that is Solomon's portico. Uh, in the middle, uh, the, the big area, are, you know, kind of the open area in the center is the court of the Gentiles. Um, in the center of the, that inner wall is labeled the beautiful gate. That's a guess. The beautiful gate is only mentioned one time. Um, it's obviously another title for one of the gates into the, the inner courts. Uh, that's as good a guess as any. Uh, that wall leads into the court of, of women. And the next court over closest to the Holy of Holies, which is that, um, well, the, the, the big tall building, the square one, uh, the, the court around that is the court of, of the Israelites or Israelite men were to gather. So um, you kind of get the idea that worship has happened. The, the Israelite men have gone into that court that belongs to them outside the Holy of Holies. Um, and now the worship service has ended and people are departing and headed back out into the court of the Gentiles. And because it's probably late spring, early summer, it's hot and people would gather naturally under the shade of Solomon's portico or Solomon's porch, as it is sometimes known, which was a common place for gathering. You know, Presbyterians tend to leave uh, the, whatever sanctuary they have, head out into the lobby or the outer courtyard, eat donuts, drink coffee, talk to one another. Sometimes they debate things. Sometimes they catch up on how's the kids. Uh, same thing 
happening in Solomon's portico. Though it was a common occurrence for people to gather there for teaching, uh, those who had a, uh, an interpretation of scriptures to give would do so there. Uh, interpretations of the law, debates would happen there. It wasn't long ago that Jesus was teaching in that same spot. And so this is what happens after worship formally ends and the community moves, uh, along with now a man lame this morning, now walking and jumping and praising God, going with them to Solomon's portico. This is from the book of Acts, the third chapter, beginning with verse 11. Luke writes, While he, that's the man who was healed, clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico that is called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is, Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you one from your own people, a prophet like me, you must listen to whatever he tells you. And it will be that everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be utterly rooted out of the people. And all of the prophets, as many as have spoken from Samuel and those after him, also predicted these days. You are the descendants of the prophets and of the covenant that God gave to your ancestors, saying to Abraham, and in your descendants, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. And so we're probably just a couple of weeks after Pentecost. Uh, Peter and John, and quite possibly the other ten apostles, are participating regularly in temple worship with their Jewish contemporaries. And for the second time now in two chapters, Peter is going to give a speech to confused peers, beginning with the words, literally in, in Greek, it's men of Israel. And the emphasis is not meant to be on the men, but on the Israel. But the point is that God's people, Israel, the, the Jews are being directly addressed. And as he recounts, Luke does, the, the history of the earliest church to the next generation. A generation located mostly in the Gentile world, Luke wants us to hear Peter speaking specifically to his Jewish contemporaries. And it brings us back to the question of, well then, you know, why a speech? Most of the content, of course, we already know. Right, verse 12, for example, you Israelites, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this miracle that has happened? Why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate. You rejected the holy and righteous one, asked that a murderer be given to you. Almost all of that we already know. 
certainly Luke's audience would have known that whole history, that whole story, There's, that, that Jesus is a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he was regarded by the church as messianic, that he was condemned under Pilate. All of that is well established. Indeed, most of it is, all of it, has already been covered in Luke's gospel, right, volume one of this two-volume series. And keep in mind, Luke's book of Acts is probably being written after most of the letters of Paul are already circulating. So Paul's already covered all this material as well. The, the church receiving Acts would have known multiple accounts of all of these events. And so the speech is not being used as a teaching device, which is very different from the gospel, right? In the gospels, Jesus is almost always the speech giver, and the reason for recording the speech is because it's instructive. And Jesus is teaching, interpreting the scriptures, explaining events that are unfolding in his ministry. That's not what's happening in Acts. And so to understand why Luke is using this device of speech, we probably would be wisest to turn back to the Hebrew scriptures and say, well, how has that device been used in the past? And what does it mean in the, the Hebrew context of, um, of speeches being recorded? And when you do that, it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that there are only a few categories of people in the Old Testament who ever give recorded speeches. Occasionally, you will hear one from a, a monarch. You could argue that the psalmist's speeches are recorded, though they're more recorded as as poems and song lyrics to be recited than they are ever put in the mouth of a particular person. Almost always, the speech giver in the Hebrew Bible is a prophet. It's a person who is empowered by God to give words of direct address to the people of God, speaking on God's behalf, right? This is why most of the prophets begin with some version of, thus says the Lord. And what follows is almost always always a combination of a call to recognize that it is God who is speaking, that God is seeking to change some behavior happening in Israel's midst. It comes with a warning of punishment, a, a promise of hope and fulfillment, and a declaration that God is going to make good on the promises of old. And in case we're not sure that that's what Luke has in mind when he puts a speech in Peter's mouth, that he's casting Peter as a prophet, uh, Luke gets out for a, a first century audience. Uh, his highlighter, his bold and italicized font, and the first words he puts into Peter's mouth are effectively, you Israelites, you men of Israel, why do you wonder at what is happening? Why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or piety, we healed this man. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus. Now that title, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, is a very, very famous line in the Hebrew scriptures. Namely, it's how God introduces himself to Moses at the burning bush. Right? Who is the, the, the sovereign who seeks to the freedom of his people, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses will then use that line multiple times, and Moses is described in the Hebrew scriptures themselves as the greatest prophet who ever lived. So Peter is now giving a speech in the power of the Spirit, hero Israel, and it opens with one of the most prophetic, or one of the the most recognizable lines of the greatest prophet Israel has ever known. He then goes on, of course, to name a whole bunch of other prophets and make reference to them over and over again. Right? In, this, this, in English, it's only 18 sentences, this whole speech. But look at the second paragraph, right? verse 17. Now, friends, I know that you acted in, in ignorance, as did also your rulers, in this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through the prophets that the Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That's a 
quote from Isaiah. It goes on in verse 21. Um, the universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. 22, Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you from your own people a prophet like me. I, mean, I won't drag you through all of it. You get the idea. The notion of prophet is being repeated over and over and over again as a way to whack us upside the head and say, you get that Peter is now fulfilling the prophetic role, right? That's why he's speaking. He is now offering the word of God's direct address in the power of the Holy Spirit to God's people. So the first thing Luke's really trying to get across to us is that the prophetic, the prophetic office continues after the resurrection, and it does so now through the church. Right, from this moment forward, from Pentecost onward, prophecy doesn't end, but it shifts its speaker from the, um, the, the her, uh, hereditary line of prophets through Abraham to the line of faith through Christ. The church now becomes the prophetic office. Go back to Peter's first speech right, on the day of Pentecost in roughly the same place. Men of Judea and all of Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Listen to what I say. These people you see are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what is spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God declares, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. The prophetic office it now will be carried forth through those who have pledged their allegiance to Jesus. And so as Peter speaks, we're supposed to hear him as a prophet of God to Israel, speaking God's word of direct address, of correction, of warning, of the promise of hope, and of the assurance that God is fulfilling his promises. Right? Hear it again. Verse 11. When the healed man, whom everyone had just witnessed walking and jumping and praising, clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, persons of Israel, why do you wonder at this? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, our, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate. You rejected the righteous and the Holy One and asked to have a murderer given to you. You killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. Right? This is the call to repentance. Right? By the, the resurrection and the outpouring of the Spirit, Jesus has been vindicated as the Messiah. Why do you wonder at what you are seeing? Hear, O Israel, why, why are you stunned? Why are you shocked? Why do you think it's through our own piety or power that we have done anything? No. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God whose temple in which we stand has glorified his servant Jesus, the one you handed over and rejected. Right? This is the wake-up call. This is the hero Israel. You need to get your head about you and understand what has happened. And behold what is happening now in your midst. And what's wonderful about the speech is that the first word that, that Peter is called to speak to Israel is actually one of mercy. Right? Verse 17, now friends, I know that you acted in ignorance. You and indeed also your rulers. It was in this way that God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. Right? The, the, the word of repentance comes with a pledge of amnesty. Like I, I understand the human condition, says the Spirit through Peter. You misunderstood. It seemed, in retrospect, obvious, but in ignorance, you persecuted the righteous and holy one. You put to death the author of life. You acted in ignorance. The charity goes even to the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who proclaimed judgment upon Jesus and demanded his death. Indeed, the prophets foretold 
that humanity would inevitably do this to God's Messiah. Right? See all of Isaiah 40 to 55. But, verse 19, repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The time of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that he may send the Messiah appointed for you. That is Jesus. Moses himself said, the Lord will raise up for you one of your own people, a prophet like me. You must listen to whatever that one tells you. And it will be that everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be utterly rooted out of the people. You are the descendants of the prophet and of the covenant that God gave to your ancestors, saying to Abraham, and in your descendants all the family of the earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So who's speaking? Right? Peter, uh, a newly minted apostle, which is essentially the role of a prophet, one sent to the world to proclaim God's news of salvation. It is Peter who's speaking in the prophetic office empowered by the Holy Spirit. To whom is he speaking? To Israel, who is standing in the temple of the God of Israel. A temple, we should note, that would soon be destroyed by the Romans, never to be rebuilt. When, on the occasion of a healing entirely in keeping with the exact promises God gave to Israel as signs of salvation. I mean, the prophets are regular. I mean, Isaiah talks about people being healed, the, the lame walking, the deaf hearing, the blind seeing. Israel sees the lame walk and says, what on earth could be happening? And Peter is saying exactly what you should expect to be happening. What's the speech about? It's ultimately the prophetic call to Israel on the, this side of the resurrection to recognize Jesus' identity. Right? In ignorance, bef before the resurrection, you acted foolishly. You didn't see what was right before you, and therefore you persecuted the righteous one. You put to death the author of life. You did that in foolishness. But now Jesus has been vindicated, raised from the dead. You see the power of God's healing, the, 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 the evidence of the coming of God's kingship right before you. Why do you look to us like we did something? I tell you, we did nothing. It was faith in the name of Jesus, whom God has glorified, that accomplished this. It's been spoken to you from the very beginning. Moses told you a greater prophet than he would come. All the other prophets spoke of one who would suffer. Now that Jesus has been raised from the dead, Israel, you've got to wake up. You have to be able to read the signs that are before you. And it's that last part last couple lines that may be the most critical of all for Luke. You are the descendants of the prophets and of the covenant that God gave to your ancestors, saying to Abraham, and in your descendants, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When he raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning you from your wicked ways. Those of you familiar with Paul's great letter to the church at Rome may remember something of its opening, right? It's the, the, the general Paul, an apostle of the Lord, to all of God's beloved who are in Rome, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on with the traditional thanksgiving. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of your faith, which is proclaimed through all the world, and he carries on with that a little bit. And then he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed 
through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Right? I am not ashamed of the content of the message of Jesus, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. One of the most elemental questions facing the early church, especially in its second and third generations, was what are we to make of a, a, a community centered on the Jewish Messiah, a community increasingly, in, a, a greater and greater percentage of that community being Gentile. It would seem to the earliest church that God is including in the citizenship roles of, of the saved people of Israel, people, even Israel, would never have thought could possibly be included. Right? Now suddenly joining the ranks of God's own people are not just notorious Sinners, Jewish, tax collectors, prostitutes, ne'er-do-wells, drunkards, and gluttons, but pagans, Roman officials, Roman soldiers, people who were never, uh, well, who for many centuries were not regarded as belonging. And the early church is asking, what is happening? What do we make of of God going to places and to people we thought were utterly taboo. The question was asked over and over and over again, especially by the, the, the Jewish Christians of the earliest church. Isn't the fundamental role of Israel to protect the purity of the, the people of God so that we're not contaminated and corrupted by the larger world. Isn't that the whole point, that we are to set ourselves uh, apart and cloister ourselves to safeguard this, this word that we have been given, the, the, the law that has been bestowed to us? And Peter in the prophetic office is responding to that question. Right? Hear, O Israel, Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you one from your own people, a prophet like me. You must listen to him and do whatever he tells you. And it will be that everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be rooted out of the people. All the prophets, as many as have spoken from Samuel and those after him, predicted these days. You are descendants of the prophets and of the covenant that God gave to your ancestors, saying to Abraham and in your descendants, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to cure you, basically, of your, your foolishness, your disobedience. Right? This is the prophetic speech being given to set the stage for what is going to be the, the story of the rest of the book of Acts, which is a, a community of the people of God who are forever at least one step behind the Spirit. The question is going to be asked over and over and over again. What is happening here? What did we just witness? Who just included who? Who just went to who and said what? It, Peter just had a ham sandwich? We just included the, the Roman... Uh, soldiers into the church. We went uh, off to Rome to go proclaim the God. Like, what is happening? And the answer is going to be over and over and over again. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O community of faith. That promise that was made that God would be a blessing, uh, the means of salvation to all the nations of the earth, that is what you're witnessing now. You've gotten yourself into the habit of thinking that that's forever later. That God has made a promise, but he's never actually going to keep it. Or if he's going to keep it, he's going to keep it 10 centuries from now and it doesn't matter to you. You just keep safeguarding the promise. Those of you who spend so much time safeguarding the promise ought to reflect on the promise. 
that the God who made it will fulfill it, and he's fulfilling it now. And to anyone who calls on the name of Jesus, the Spirit is poured out to be that prophetic voice. That which Israel is witnessing is nothing but what God promised all along. And the question for the the people of God will always be then, can we believe that what we are witnessing right now is the fulfillment of the promise of salvation? It's going to get hard because God is going to go to a lot of places we don't expect. And the argument will continue well into the 21st century. Can God go there to them now? Really? Don't they have to like be entirely different first? Uh, off we go. With that, we pray. Gracious God, you call us to be guardians of the truth, to safeguard the word that has been entrusted to us, to protect the content of the faith. We are meant to be good stewards of the scriptures given to us. And yet part of the essential word of the scriptures is that you are regularly in the business of doing new things in the larger work of salvation. The church is often one step behind, constantly shocked at the new thing that is being done. Forgive us for our stubbornness and hard-heartedness. Grant us wisdom to discern spirits between that which is your leading and that which is the, the temptation to sin and folly. Help us together to um, hold each other in our hearts with good feeling, to listen well to each other, to collectively be able to discern that no one of us will come with the complete understanding but that together as your body, we might hear the word of your spirit afresh. Bless us with your presence as we continue in worship, for we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you join me in a collective prayer as we receive this morning's offering? Oh God, our God, have mercy on us. Today we remember your blessings with a grateful heart and outstretched hand.
big finish with a band. You may be seated. A couple announcements before we go. Uh, a reminder to those who are volunteers with our family ministries, the sign-up sheet for July, uh, it's really the sign-up chalkboard, is now available in the lobby. So uh, if you are able to, to put your dates down, this is, of course, the time of year when lots of people go on vacation and stuff. So the, the, the more we get some advance notice of who's available when, the greater a help that is to our schedulers. Uh, back before COVID hit, um, uh, my friend Chanetta Goodjoin, the pastor over at New Hope Presbyterian, and I used to trade pulpits with some regularity because it's really uh, good for everybody to, to connect that way. Um, so she is going to guest preach for us next Sunday. I guest preached there a couple of Sundays ago, and I'm just we're going to have to practice a little bit because at Chanetta's church, um, I literally, I, I preached the same sermon on Saturday night, and I came and I preached it here. So I have all, and Emily recorded, my lovely wife recorded uh, the one at New Hope. So I literally have like the time code of the Canvas video and the New Hope video. I'm just going to say there's about 17 more amens uh, shouted out uh, at the New Hope one. Um, thank you. All right. Now, this is exactly that. So when Chinetta comes, she's used to people shouting out, amen, mm-hmm, I love you, yeah, right, yeah, you go. Uh, we tend to be a little less that. So, uh, you see, yeah, so, yeah, this week, I want you at random times to just shout out at people, amen. And just practice that so you get it in the earth, whatever you know, Ralph's or wherever you are, give the occasional just hallelujah, and we'll be ready for next Sunday because it, it's a... As a preacher, it is a wonderful thing to receive that. So, uh, okay, our next Jesus at 7 p.m., that's a chance to hang out over food and beer and talk theology, uh, will be July the 17th, or July the 13th, I'm sorry. That's a Wednesday night. As you know, we are always looking for cool places to hang out that are friendly and not crazy loud. Uh, we think we may have found one at the Woodbridge Village Center patio where the Sessions Deli and surrounding environments are. So we're going to meet there uh, 7 p.m. on the 13th for um, theology discussion, and then again uh, for our end of the month um, uh, lunch. We'll get to that in a second. Our next Canvas Book Club meeting is on Tuesday, July the 26th. Uh, it's at the house of Ken and Amy Chan, which is in Irvine over by the Great Park, uh, 7 o'clock on the 26th. The book is The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Clune which I have not read, but everyone tells me is a very uplifting, hopeful, feel-good, um, loving and inclusive read. So uh, need a little cheer. That seems like a good thing to do. You can sign up for the discussion on the website. As I mentioned, during the summer, we're trying to go out to lunch at least once a, month, a month uh, and get back into the habit of, you know, hanging out with one another. So uh, last Sunday of every month, this month it will be the 31st, back to the Woodbridge Village Center, lots of restaurants coffee places, that kind of stuff. There, it's very kid-friendly. There's stuff to play on, places to run around. It's lovely. Um, if we don't have your email address, you know, we'd love to make sure that we stay in touch about all the events that are coming up. So come to the benediction. I keep thinking of alternative titles for the book of Acts. Um, it was never originally called that. Uh, it's not the best title. Uh, lately, I've been playing around with some version of, you know, the book shouldn't be titled, wait, what now? Where, what? I clearly did not hear that correctly. God sent who to where? And what? Wow, like Ethiopian eunuchs, really, did not see that coming. Roman centurions did not see that coming. Right? Where, where people are accepted, you didn't expect. Where people are thrown out of dodge, you did not expect. The whole story is one of did not see that coming. And it's the ultimate lesson of Acts for us, that we uh, sometimes settle in in a way that we, we like church to be predictable. We like, we like life to be predictable. We live in Irvine, for God's sake. We're as predictable as it, the, the paint color on the walls has been determined by law, right? And stucco of this color, this size, man, unto eternity. Man, that is not the church ever. From day one, it was not, all right, let's all settle in, get it just how we like it, and just maintain. It is constantly being dragged, almost always against our will and our better judgment, 
to a place we do not want to go, to people we don't think we like, only to discover God is doing incredible works of redemption and healing in that spot. And our main job is to try to help uh, and, exp- and to offer to other people the words. What is happening here? Right? What, th- this dude who was lame is now walking. What happened? It's not us. It's not our power or piety. It's the name of Jesus the Lord. Oh, most people don't know that's what's going on. Our job to explain. With that, will you stand for the benediction? May the God of peace, the God of shalom, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of his eternal covenant, may he give us all every good gift and make us complete so that we may do his will. As God himself works within us that which is pleasing in his sight, to him be the glory now and forever. The missionary people of God joyfully said, Hallelujah, Amen.